CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is The World Today. Hello, I'm Jamie Owen. Welcome to the program. Our top stories, four new vice premiers and other key officials endorsed as the world's biggest political gathering, China's National People's Congress, prepares to close. Our other headlines, more protests in Greece two weeks after that train crash in which 57 people, mainly students, were killed in the country's worst ever railway disaster. And the shape of the future, how one Spanish architect is drawing inspiration from China for her designs. China has announced more key appointments in the central government as the world's biggest political gathering, the 14th National People's Congress, comes to a close. Four new vice premiers have been named, with other senior posts also confirmed. Our correspondent Zhong Chongying reports. China's new vice premiers have been formally appointed. Xi Jinping, elected president of China last Friday, signed a presidential decree to endorse Ding Xuexiang, He Lifeng, Zhang Guoqing, Liu Guozhong as the country's new vice premiers. Nearly 3,000 lawmakers voted to approve the nomination. And they swore to uphold the country's constitution. In the coming years, the new vice premiers are expected to assist the new premier, Li Qiang, in accomplishing several crucial tasks ahead. According to the government work report delivered last Sunday, China has set its annual GDP growth target at around 5% for 2023. As the country hopes to sustain economic recovery after three years of battling COVID-19. China is working to ensure economic stability and high-quality growth amid global economic volatility and geopolitical uncertainty. The appointment of the high-ranking government leaders follows the approval of an institutional reform plan of the State Council on Friday, which called for reforms in the Ministry of Science and Technology and in the areas of financial supervision, data management, rural revitalization, intellectual property rights, and care for the elderly. Deputies stressed that the reform represents an important step in enhancing the capacity and efficiency of governance as part of China's modernization drive. The reforms may help China outperform its economic target for 2023 despite external risks and challenges. During the fifth plenary meeting of the first session of the 14th National People's Congress, deputies have also voted to confirm new state councillors and other high-level officials such as ministers, ministers in charge of various commissions, central bank governor, Auditor General and Secretary General of the State Council, as well as leaders and members of eight special committees of the NPC. The Chinese people are now expecting a more rapid and stable economic recovery under the new government leadership, which will help the country develop and improve people's quality of life as it embarked on a new path marked by greater democracy, vitality and confidence. Zhang Chuyin, CGTN, at the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. Well, several top figures remain in their posts, including the governor of the People's Bank of China, Alessandro Tiexia, is professor at the Tianhao University in Beijing. I asked him what we should make of this. Here they, they achieved 3% of economic growth. They are expecting uh, for uh, this year 5% of economic growth. In order to do that, they should continue uh, a more tight fiscal policy also a more tight monetary policy, but they need to stimulate consumption. The way Chinese government sees is that uh, they, they deal with the dual circulation economy. One comes from the international markets that has shrink, and another one comes from the internal markets. So they are, they are put their chips on the internal market. So they're going to stimulate uh, the local economy, the national economy, in order to achieve a such uh, growth. And presumably having these same familiar faces in finance sends a very clear signal to the international community. Exactly. 
the keeping the same people, especially in the central bank, and as a minister of finance, send a message that you can trust. So there is uh, predictability on, on, on the horizon. Another important element is that China is going to keep doing the reforms that are necessary, is going to keep opening up its economy, is going to welcome each day more foreign investment and is going to try to tap on entrepreneurship, innovation and science and technology as one of the engines of economic growth in China. Now, earlier this week, China announced plans for uh, a national financial regulatory administration. Um, what does that mean exactly in practice? What's going to be happening there? Me means that China is trying to manage a possible recession for the second semester and also regulate the financial system because, of course, everybody is afraid of what's going on right now around the world, especially with the Silicon Valley uh, Bank. So they are trying to regulate the economy so we don't have any default or any crisis. We always need to remember that last year, during the Evergrande, a large construction company in China that went almost bankrupt, all the international markets were very nervous with China. So this situation of keeping the same people, trying to regulate the financial market, wants to show stability and previsibility. In the, con in the Chinese economy. Deputies to the National People's Congress, China's top legislature, are elected to represent the people at the two sessions. Their duties include reviewing legislative agendas and work reports. But they can also submit suggestions to improve the running of the country. Thousands of suggestions are made, and these all need to be sorted, CGTN's correspondent Huang Yu reports. Submitting motions and suggestions to the National People's Congress is one of the major duties of deputies who are elected by the people to represent the public's interests. During this year's session, deputies have submitted a total of 271 motions and 8,500 suggestions. They have done a lot of research and interviews, and those motions and suggestions reflect people's concerns. The motions that NPC deputies submit will become legally binding once adopted. But before they can submit, they need to get at least 30 signatures for each one. The official with the NPC Standing Committee says the quality of this year's motions improved a lot. For example, 60 percent of the motions we received this year are attached with the text of draft laws, which is a remarkable progress. So far, 69 legislative items from the motions have been included in legislative planning work of the MPC Standing Committee. Deputy suggestions cover a wide range of the areas, including upgrading real economy development, accelerating agricultural modernization, and enhancing medical services at grassroots level. In the past, you will see papers piled up on the desks here as hundreds of motions and thousands of suggestions are submitted by deputies every year during the two sessions. However, in recent years, the Internet has helped a lot. The NPC Standing Committee has developed a platform to provide all the procedures for addressing the motions and suggestions, including submissions, communications and feedback. The working group says they haven't stopped receiving paper submissions because they want to ensure that all deputies, including those older or less tech-savvy ones, can exercise their rights of submitting motions and putting forward suggestions. Huang Yue, CGTN, Beijing. Four people have been killed in the latest Russian missile attacks on Ukraine. Three people lost their lives when the car park of a supermarket was struck in the city of Kherson. A fourth person died elsewhere in the Donbass region. President Zelensky has uh, denounced what he called brutal terrorist attacks on civilians by Russian troops. This comes as both sides claim to have killed hundreds in the battle for Bakhmut. France's Senate has voted to approve President Emmanuel Macron's unpopular pension reform plan amid more protests. Clashes with police broke out in several cities as demonstrators voiced anger over plans to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. The bill will now be reviewed by a committee before going to a final vote in Parliament. 
South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa has been cleared of wrongdoing following a corruption investigation. In their preliminary report, the public prosecutor says there's no evidence he acted improperly in relation to the theft of around $600,000 in cash from his ranch. President Ramaphosa, who's seeking a second term next year, denied failing to report the theft and claimed the cash was being held to pay for a delivery of buffalo. More protests have been taking place in Greece nearly two weeks after that train crash in which 57 people, the majority of them students, were killed in the country's worst railway disaster. Police at one stage fired tear gas at protesters in the capital, Athens. There's widespread anger over what's seen as years of underfunding of the railway network and wider concern about decision-making by successive governments. Well, let's talk now to uh, our correspondent, Evangelo Sipsas, in Athens. Uh, Evangelo, just how big are these demonstrations expected to be compared to what we've seen uh, in previous days? Well, today's demonstration wasn't as big as the one we saw last Wednesday, but it was large. We're talking about at least 10,000 people surrounded this square in front of the Greek parliament, uh, demanding answers of the uh, crash that had took place uh, on February 28th. Uh, a number of unions were here from the rail worker unions, uh, people working in the health, indus in the health industry, uh, pharmacists, even uh, the Greek Actors Union was here present in today's protest. Uh, also another protest took place in Thessaloniki, the country's second largest city, uh, with about five to 6,000 people attending that demonstration there. So these protests are building up, the anger is building up, and people are coming out in numbers. And we're seeing these numbers. We haven't seen actually these type, these uh, numbers since the 2012, the time where Greece was going through austerity measures and during the time that uh, we're, the country was going through a financial crisis. So we're seeing anger building up. We're seeing a lot of people coming out here on the protest demanding answers of what took place. Uh, uh, there are going to be a number of protests continuing in the next few days as well. Uh, but we're seeing we're going to see another large protest on March 16th, which is next Thursday. There's a general strike that has been called and we're going to be seeing large numbers similar to those numbers in uh, last Wednesday where about 50,000 people came onto the streets uh, protesting of uh, that deadly crash that took place on February 28th. Evangelo, what do the demonstrators want the government to do exactly? Well, they're, uh, what they're demanding is uh, people to be brought to justice, those responsible to pay. They were holding banners today here during the protest saying that we will not leave and will continue these demonstrations until justice is served. And when they say justice is served, they don't mean justice just uh, the one person, the station manager who has been arrested, the one who was responsible for that incident during, uh, in the night of the crash, the 59-year-old who was charged with manslaughter uh, and negligence causing homicide, but they want justice of people, high-ranked people, people, politicians, uh, engineers, those who were supposed to uh, put these safety controls into place and did not. And not only from the government the, of Kyriakos Mitsotakis, the current Greek government, but the previous governments as well, the Syriza party and the Pasok party, because they're saying that these issues are not just an issue of the current government, but it's an issue that has been building up since the early 2000s. Uh, the dilapidated infrastructure has not been updated, uh, at least since 2000. Uh, the, 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 it was underfunded. The, the, they did get grants from the European Union to uh, upgrade that, but nothing happened. And and that's what the people are calling. They're saying that we want those who were supposed to put those systems in place to be brought to justice. We've seen the transport minister resign, uh, took responsibility for what happened, but they're saying that that is not enough. We need, we need to see more actions. We need to see more politicians and more people uh, take responsibility for the incident on February 28th. Now, the rail worker union said we've uh, mentioned this many times, but no one heard us, said pretty much that it fell in deaf ears. But also what the rail worker unions are asking besides the, the, besides the legal part is that we need to go back to uh, operating these trains. But before we be able to go there, we need the government to uh, give us safety protocols. So not only the people who are going to be riding the train, but those working also will be safe. Evangelo, thank you for that. Our correspondent Evangelo Sipsas in Athens. You're watching CGTN, still ahead. We meet a Spanish architect drawing inspiration from China for her futuristic buildings.
There's a new agenda for a new world, accelerating change in almost every part of our lives. It's shifting the norms of how we work, travel, and connect. How we think, interact, and develop. It's a new reality, a new agenda with me, Juliet Mann. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with global business, only on CGTF. This week on Razor, building highways for bees and finding out how life moved from water to land. Those genes that are responsible for this adaptation were brought into this organism by a DNA virus. Now the question is, where did the viruses get the bacterial genes from? Hello, welcome back. A reminder of our top stories. Four new vice premiers and other key officials endorsed as the world's biggest political gathering, China's National People's Congress, prepares to close. Our other headlines, more protests in Greece two weeks after that train crash in which 57 people, mainly students, were killed in the country's worst ever railway disaster. This weekend marks the third anniversary of the COVID-19 being officially declared a pandemic that's defined as a disease spreading all over the world by the World Health Organization. The virus is still spreading and the number of deaths is approaching 7 million people. But for many, life has returned to normal thanks to immunity and vaccination. There are encouraging figures coming out of Europe with decreasing death rates, but 765 deaths were still reported from 23 EU countries in the first week of March. New variants keep emerging. The top three in Europe are currently XBB 1.5 with over 38% of the infections, BQ1 with over 23% and BA2 with around 22%. And vaccination rollouts are continuing in Europe. Over 65% of adults have now had a first booster with over 17% having had a second. Well, let's talk to uh, Dr. Margaret Harris from the World Health Organization. Dr. Harris, um, welcome to the program. Are we close to um, the end of this pandemic? Good afternoon. We're still very much in it. I, those figures you just gave were, are an indicator. And indeed, I mean, in the last week, we saw 980,000 new cases globally. And we know that that's an underreporting because many countries are not testing the way they were. Sadly, we lost 5,800 people last week. And we continue to see large, uh, those high numbers of deaths. Now, the good news is, yes, the numbers have come down. But it's not good news if you are one of those people suffering. Um, and we are actually seeing a rise in some European countries. So, for instance, in um, Eastern Europe particularly, we did see a rise in cases. And overall in Europe, we saw a 12% rise in the last month. So we're certainly not at the end of it. But as you mentioned, we're in a better place because of the use of vaccination and better treatment. Three years on, what have we learned? Have we learned any lessons from coronavirus? We've learned when we work together, we do very, very well. We worked very well together on vaccination. That was, there was great transparency. There was great sharing of the information, sharing of the genome, which enabled the scientists right from nearly the first week to get on with the job and continued sharing. What we haven't done so well and what we need to do far better is to share. To share. I said we were sharing information, but to share what we create. So sharing those tools, once we got the vaccines, once we got the treatments, even the protective equipment, the, the countries with the greatest resources and power 
tended to keep that and it was a real struggle to get those tools out. We still have eight of our WHO member states who vaccinated less than 10% of their population. And worldwide, uh, the high-risk people, the people, older people, we're still seeing only 49% of those people have been vaccinated in lower-income countries. So we've got a lot more work to do. What did the WHO get right and what did the WHO get wrong? We got right the getting people together. We got right the information as we understood it. We got right the talking to the world as often and as openly as possible. What we all got wrong was we weren't necessarily right about what we knew and didn't know about the virus. We all need to be better at accepting that when you've got something completely new, you, you have to keep your mind very open. And that was a struggle, I think, for everybody. The other thing we didn't do as well as we would like to have done, as I said before, is to really get the world to share. Uh, the tools won't work unless everybody's got it. And we didn't, we weren't able as the world to get those tools to everybody. There are raging debates about uh, lockdown uh, around the world. Did lockdown work? So lockdown was always something I think you know the WHO was never keen on because it's got enormous economic and social consequences. And what we were saying was take all the other measures that we know should prevent the virus raging through your population out of control so that that doesn't happen. You don't have to get to a, a stage where the only thing you can do is put your population into quarantine. So that's what a lot of authorities ended up doing. A lockdown is simply putting the entire population into quarantine. But there were many things you could do before, and particularly the testing, the isolation, the tracking of people who actually had the virus and, and getting people who are at highest risk protected. A lot more of that had to happen more quickly. Dr. Harris, good to talk to you. Thanks ever so much for coming on the programme. Dr. Margaret Harris from uh, the World Health Organization. Pleasure. The former vice president of the United States under Donald Trump has made his strongest criticism yet of his old boss. Mike Pence said Trump was wrong and that history would hold him accountable for the storming of the U.S. Capitol in 2021. Pence added he, his family and others were put at risk by Trump's reckless words and called the storming a disgrace. Pence is believed to be considering his own run for the Republican nomination for the U.S. presidency. The UK is preparing a cash lifeline for tech firms hit by the collapse of the British arm of Silicon Valley Bank. Britain's finance minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, warned there was serious risk for the sector. He held emergency talks with the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, and the Governor of the Bank of England late into Saturday. This follows the collapse of SVP's American parent company on Friday. The world's biggest oil company, Saudi Aramco, has announced a record profit of $161 billion for 2022. That's a nearly 47% rise on the previous year for the Saudi state-owned company. It's the latest energy firm to announce bumper profits after prices spiked following Russia's attack on Ukraine. Spain is celebrating 50 years of diplomatic relations with China and as part of our coverage, CGTN has been talking to a Spanish architect who has built a remarkable relationship with China. Our correspondent Ken Brown reports. Designing the future. That's what Spanish architect Rosa Cervera has been doing for the past four decades. Her work has taken her around the world and she has created beautiful, functional and sustainable buildings from India to Bolivia. Her creations also stand proudly in Chengdu, Hangzhou and Shanghai in China. Cervera has a deep connection with Chinese culture and even designed the Chinese embassy buildings in Madrid. China has helped a lot myself to be the, the woman that I am now, the person that I am. I learned a lot from China and, and I my, admire part of uh, their culture and their philosophy and their way of being. For more than 20 years, Rosa has been working on a futuristic project called the Bionic Tower. 
We cannot pave the planet, she says, and this visionary vertical city could potentially house more than 100,000 people. This city of cities would be 300 stories and over 1,000 meters high, powered by wind turbines and solar panels. It would even have its own farm. Officials in both Shanghai and Hong Kong have expressed interest. While the Bionic Tower has yet to be built, it's a vertical vision for the future of sustainable housing on a mind-blowing scale. The Chinese embassy here in Madrid behind me stands as a testament to Rosa Cervera's talent. And while she's been designing physical structures for decades, she's also been building cultural bridges too. She is now the president of Catedra China, a Spanish think tank that promotes greater understanding between Spain, Europe and China. The main goal of Catalonia China is to bring both countries together and to get the Spanish people more friendly with the Chinese world, the Chinese culture. The hope is really to avoid prejudices and to meet the people. An affinity for Chinese culture and a vision for the future have sustained the remarkable work of Rosa Cervera. Her physical and cultural bridges are built to last. Ken Brown, CGTN, Madrid. The headlines again. Four new vice premiers and other key officials endorsed as the world's biggest political gathering, China's National People's Congress, prepares to close. Our other headlines, more protests in Greece two weeks after that train crash in which 57 people, mainly students, were killed in the country's worst ever railway disaster. And that is The World Today. Thank you for watching. More news at the top of this hour. Coming up next, it's Razor. For now, from all of the team in London, it's goodbye.